Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's CPD webinar. My name is Claire Barton, and I will be your host. Our CPD webinars are brought to you by the Chartered Governance Institute of Canada, the only global qualifying organization in Canada where you can become a Chartered Governance Professional. CGIC is renowned for providing educational programs that support governance professionals throughout all stages of their career. Our next Director's Education and Accreditation Program is scheduled for December the 6th, and I invite you to visit our website at cgiofcanada.ca for further information. Today's CPD webinar is sponsored by our Quebec branch. We have two guest speakers, Sandra Porches and Mary Larson, and they will be presenting the board's duty in fostering EDI within the organization. Before we begin the presentation, please note that everyone is muted. Should you have a question, you may click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen. And I would like to now welcome the president of the Quebec branch, Dora Coop. And Dora will introduce our two guest speakers. Thank you, Dora. Hi, and thanks, Claire, and welcome to everyone. Um, as Claire mentioned, as the president of the Quebec branch of the CGIC, I'm really happy today to introduce Mary Larson and Sandra Porches. Um, since you've registered for the session, I'm assuming that you've read the profiles on the website, and you know that they both work for MNP Consulting Services. I've known Mary for many years, and I can say that she has been active in promoting DEI both in her work and the volunteer organization that she works with. She really does practice what she says. In, her, in addition to her consulting work, she is very familiar with the challenges you face as board members or advising the boards that you work with. She serves as a member of the advisory committee of the Trisima Investments, is the board chair of the McGill School for Continuing Studies, and is a board member of the Shea Doris Foundation. It'll be interesting to hear both Sandra and Mary discuss DEI as they come from very different backgrounds. Sandra started as a journalist in the male dominated news organizations and most recently saw her becoming the first director of inclusion and engagement for both CBC and the Ontario Transit Agency, Metrolinx. She has con conducted focus groups with members of equity seeking groups that led to key actions and substantive changes to policies and processes, including unbiased hiring practices, meeting culture and tracking workplace demographics. As you can tell from her bio, Sandra has lots of experience implementing programs to help address the different components of DEI issues that would exist within organizations. And I'm sure we're gonna learn a lot from both of our guest speakers today. So I will, upon saying that, I think the format's gonna take the place of a fireside chat. So I'm going to turn it over to both Sandra and Mary at this time. Great. Thank you, Dora. Really appreciate this. And we're really very honored to be here today and, and talking about this um, topic that we are um, absolutely passionate about. I think it's fair to say that I spent much of my early career and actually um, my uh, university years and grad school years kind of almost feeling like I was the only one. Um, in early days, there were very, very few women um, at the university that I went to and at the business school I went to. And when I was working in New York City, there weren't very many of us either in professional roles. So I've been um, you know, uh, experiencing um, aspects of uh, what EDI ought to be and what it could be and uh, care deeply about it. So what we're gonna talk about today and Sandra and I are gonna have kind of go back and forth on this, but. I think at the first thing, Sandra, um, for for many of us, I mean, we read about EDI and or DEI or whatever you would like to to call it. But I, I and we are going to be taking this from the standpoint of uh, directors' points of view and how to deal with it. But kind of bring us back to you know the first principles about 
what it is and where it kind of fits on that continuum of being a decent human being and caring about people to being actually a really important business practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you very much. And again, thanks uh, to everybody who's listening in. Um, one of the things I think that is a major roadblock for people when they start thinking about, I want to learn more about equity or diversity and inclusion is they actually don't know how to begin. And, and so it's complex work. Um, and so what one of the things that Mary and I try to do with all of our clients is to take this complex thing and to break it into bite-sized pieces and make it much more understandable. So one of the keys to that is common language. Um, if you and I share a common language, we can have any kind of conversation. And frankly, the barriers start to come down and you start hearing more and more questions because you've actually created a safe space for people to talk about it. I mean, from all backgrounds. Um, so one of the things we like to talk about is, you know, how can we define these words that get thrown around all the time? So really what we try to say is diversity is a fact. Um, you know, we like to joke that the mayors of some cities will get up and brag about how diverse, for example, the city of Toronto is, but it doesn't matter who the mayor is. Um, they don't sort of own that success, if you like. Um, it's a fact. Um, Canadians uh, move into cities, uh, new Canadians move into cities, and so diversity is a fact. It's a bit of a statistic, right? And then we look at equity. Equity is actually where it gets really fun because equity is a choice. Um, organizations can decide to put equity at the top of the list. And that's why you see some organizations referring to this, um, this area as EDI instead of DEI, because they've said, okay, equity is the most important thing. And then when you're trying to figure out what does inclusion even mean, which believe it or not, we're asked all the time, um, inclusion is the action. It's sort of the act of delivering on that come on in piece. And if you get that all right, then a high number of employees or people in an organization will say, I feel I belong here. And when you get to the B piece, you're really hitting it out of the park. I've seen organizations that, that hired many, many people based um, on statistics um, of how many equity deserving people might be in their city. And then we've come back a year later and done a workforce demographic survey. If half of those people have left, you forgot the most important part, which is the B. So I want to be authentic at work. I want to come to work. I want to be able to be who I am. And if you can achieve that, then those people not only stay, but you're building trust with people um, who contribute to organizations, I think, in a really powerful way. So um, th that's kind of the language we use. Um, and Mary, I don't know if you want me to, I can sort of take you through the, uh, you know, really condensed history of how this has worked in Canada. I think that'd be great. Yeah, okay. I think that, because we are, we are at yeah. a place, I think, and we've talked about this a lot where five, six years ago, people were kind of, oh my God, I got to go to, you know, EDI training or DEI training. This is going to be really boring. And now it is a, a very, it's a pervasive topic that, yeah. that is commanding a lot of attention. So I think that'd be really useful. Yeah, and, and and I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples. And, and one is that when I started in this space, um, people would, you know, we would go to these workshops and sessions and people would say, let's make the business case. We're gonna make the business case for, for EDI or DEI. And everybody would say, well, okay, we, we know there's a business case. We know diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams. We read the book, Wisdom of Crowds, and if you haven't, please do. It's, it's the ultimate argument for why the more people you have in a room who have different thoughts and ideas, the better your solutions are. And so we know that diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams. And people said, yes, I know that. Um, you've made the business case, thank you. Oh, look, it's noon, time for lunch. And there was never any actions attached to that sort of good intentions piece. Um, so that was sort of the beginning of the work, I think. And Canadians really like to brag that, you know, um, you know, we had a multiculturalism act before most other countries, that we didn't believe in a melting pot, we believed in a mosaic, come to Canada and be whoever you are. Um, so then what started to happen is people started to say, okay, the business case didn't really work. It didn't move much, didn't move people down the continuum. So then they switched over to something I like to call it the right thing to do argument. Canadians are good people. We say thank you. 
We have strong morals. We also say we're sorry a lot. Yeah, I'm so sorry you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot that. Yes, I forgot about every time I get off the plane. I've usually apologized four times before I get up to where the captain's standing. But the reality is that 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 was great, and people said, "Yeah, we really should do this." But it's it's very similar to you know uh, you know saying to your dad says, "Yes, I'm going to floss daily," and you get home, you may, you mean to do these things, and then you don't. So it didn't really do much. And as you might remember. Um, good intentions are fantastic, uh, you know, road paving materials. I always love to say the good intentions piece set us back so far because organizations did things they thought were a good idea. Maybe it was a multicultural potluck and they said, look at all the different kinds of food. Okay, we're done now. And that didn't shift things. And then unbelievably, we've, we've in two parts of, well, many parts of the world, but I'll just talk about North America. The, the recent racial reckonings were for people who've been working in this space for a long time, um, or members of equity deserving groups, there has been a shift. And it's unfortunate what took the shift to happen, but I do believe that you have to know where you came from if you wanna know where you're going. And, and number one, really for North Americans, not just Americans, um, was the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Um, we saw Black Canadians, we saw obviously a huge numbers of people in the U.S. saying, how much more evidence do you need to act? And I think there was just this visceral reaction as there should have been to some pretty disturbing video. Um, and, you know, we've, we've sort of seen this both professionally at work and personally. So, so one of the key learnings I had was that uh, you know, members of the black community and even members of my, even my, you know, family members had a reaction to George Floyd that wasn't an hour or two hours. It was long lasting. It, it was just this epiphany that North Americans had that maybe finally um, we've got to talk about this. And then in Canada, um, really what we had was a very similar experience. Um, I know when I studied Canadian history, we learned about residential schools. I know that I've worked in organizations that meant to act on truth and reconciliation uh, commitments. But really, when we started to hear more about residential schools and graves, you saw Canadians, again, having that epiphany, that wake-up call that, you know, this whole Indigenous history that we've, we've glossed over needs to be addressed. And I need to understand, I mean, people ask us all the time, are Métis people different from Inuit people from First Nations? Well, there's 70 Aboriginal languages spoken in Canada. And if you're a Maliseet person, a Algonquin from New Brunswick or Quebec, you're, you're completely different as you should be, uh, somebody who's Cree, um, you know, from Tall Cree Nation. And so you see organizations and individuals kind of being forced to confront this history. I call it our shared history. And the only positive thing I can ever say that came out of all that was it led people to say, so what do I do? How do I be an effective ally? So people are asking that individually. I think a lot of people, particularly because we were glued to our screens for yeah. a lot of that period, um, it, it, it somehow reach people in a way that it wouldn't have if they were just hearing it on the nightly news or a radio station on the way to work, it became part of the fabric. But why should, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole argument about what role should companies play in this? Are they, you know, what, do they have a social role do, or, you know, and we've, I know we've talked about this, you know, who is the greatest stakeholder? Is it the shareholder or is it only the shareholder? But what's the, and you talked a little bit about the business case, yeah. and I want to go back to, I don't want to go back to that, but why should companies care about this beyond the well, business case? Because it's obvious. Yeah, I, I just, I, I think every time we sort of have this conversation, you know, we, we talk about, you know, what does inclusion look like? And the way I've been able to kind of help people make the shift, I think, is by forgetting about the word inclusion for a while and using the word exclusion. So if I'm, if, if I'm a director or if I'm a CEO of an organization, my question shouldn't be who's included. Well, we already know that, but who's not at the table and who's excluded? And my question always is, why wouldn't you want to hear from people who reflect your community, your customers, and your colleagues? 
because I will tell you this, this is the, the, this is the gift of hope that I bring today. If you can start these conversations and start authentically to focus on equity, diversity, inclusion in any company, it will, it begins to take off. It becomes to be, be organic and people start to celebrate difference and they come, they break out of their bubble because Canadians don't really want to admit it, but most Canadians and Americans in recent surveys, when asked, do you have a close personal friend who does not look like you? Like, we'll just talk about racialized or visible minority. Most Canadians say, and they, they're embarrassed to say it, especially Canadians, they say, well, no, but there's, my barber's black and people go, okay, that's great, but we don't know each other the way we should. Many Canadians have never gone into an Indigenous community. And so my question always to CEOs and business leaders and so folks we've worked with is why wouldn't you want to know about, for example, the 52% of Torontonians, and you look at the stats for Montreal, why wouldn't you want to understand what people from all different kinds of group, groups want and more importantly need? So we're trying to shift the thinking beyond tokenism to human equity you know and again if you can get people sold into the idea of you should care because everyone's happier when we're treated with equity um, I'll give you a quick example after World War II somebody decided to create the curb cut so I don't know if you've ever walked down a sidewalk and the curb dips down and it makes it easy for you to cross the street. Well, th those curb cuts were created to help veterans returning from World War II, but they also helped women with strollers. They helped seniors who were having difficulty walking. So I would just say this, when you focus on equity, the high tide lifts all boats. Everyone in the organization is made better by this work. So the reasons to do it far outweigh the reasons not to do it. And the last thing I'll say, it's Mary, Mary's going to write down that I said that's the last thing I'll say about this because it won't be. But I think it's really important for people to remember, this doesn't take millions of dollars. We're not looking for performative acts. We're not looking for organizations to take out a full page ad. We're looking um, to organizations to treat people within the company um, equitably and to consider the needs of customers who are no, have, they have nothing in common with. That's how you can build success. So, and one of the things that, that we've talked about a lot, and I think in our work, we, we work with organizations to develop their EDI strategies is the link between um, truly paying attention to um, equity and, and inclusion and belonging is the impact on uh, retention and hiring. So could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Because I think oh, that, yeah. that, is, that yeah. is such an important issue today. It, it's huge. And, and I think one of the things that happens that again gets, gets me very excited, no matter how many times we, Mary and I work with a client, is once we start scoping out what the strategy should include, there's actions you can take within the first six months that have impact. And, and one of the key things we're, we're trying to reverse engineer right now is figuring out why Canadian organizations, and they call it the, the hat and shoes problem. You know, we have organizations at the entry level, very diverse young people, brilliant young people, many new Canadians who joined an organization. You go to the middle of the organization and you see some representation. You get to the top and you might see a sprinkling and people might even say, you know, that's tokenism. There's, you know, there's always one black VP in a Canadian company. And again, that's not what you want. You want organizations to reflect um, the cities and the communities and the nation and in, in all its richness and diversity. But that leads to a question. Why is it that we hire people who are diverse at the entry level, they have a hard time bumping into the middle and then an even harder time at the top. So to Mary's point, that all comes down to, you know, how you recruit, where you recruit, do you just keep going to the same place? Um, it, it really depends on who you decide to develop. Do you have an internal development, leadership development program? And then of course, it depends on making sure you remove all barriers so that people from all different kinds of backgrounds can make it up to the most senior jobs. And that's the commitment. Um, I've worked with some really great people over the years. I, I was working with a, a, a CEO once who said, well, everyone's welcome to come and work here. And I said, no, that's not the message. The message is people have a right 
to aspire to the highest level of work they can do. You're not giving them a gift. Canadians have to get their head wrapped around it that we don't own those jobs. And when you see people pushing back on EDI, they think they're going to lose something. And they're not because, of course, it's not pie. There's enough to go around. There's enough great opportunities. It's not a zero-sum game. So, so to your point, Mary, I think one of the biggest things we're seeing is we're seeing boards asking, frankly, human resources practitioners and professionals very tough questions. If you hired 13 Indigenous employees who were brilliant and a year later five work here, what happened? Well, that, yeah. that speaks to the retention piece is were people made to feel as if they belonged? And by the way, the, the, the only cost I can ever think of some of this is you have to do better orientations, right? You have to help people fit into the organization. You have to work with the managers to help them understand this employee speaks three languages. One is English. So let's be let's be supportive of this person and make sure that they have an opportunity to you know increase their their proficiency in speaking and writing in English. Um, so so I do think Mary's right. HR and and we're seeing boards ask tough questions, and I'm always thrilled they do because when boards ask tough questions. CEOs, as you know, leave the room and walk downstairs and say to their SMT or to their HR business partner, um, what are we doing about this? Because a lot of this is barriers, right? Right. So um, you had some questions for me, Sandra. I definitely do. Um, <laughs> you know, people, people, I always look at Mary's expertise is so different from mine that I'm always fascinated. Um, so one of the things that sort of interests me is, is when we're talking about um, a, a group such as this, um, we know that today, you know, I, I, the piece I do understand is investors obviously don't any longer blindly make decisions. Um, I think there's a lot of people who um, very much believe in social justice or they believe uh, that morally and in terms of their personal values, they, they have to invest in organizations that they would support, not just that they like their product. Um, and they're starting obviously to take all parts of this seriously. Um, I never think there's a risk to that, but can you talk a bit about that, Mary, that the risk versus the opportunity piece of this? Well, yeah, I, first of all, I, I think that what I want to talk about first, though, is this issue about what board should be doing. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and and this is is a really interesting thing because um, I mean, one of the things that's kind of scary uh, is we have heard we have heard a few people who are connected with boards, such as people like yourselves, who've said, you know, we can't pay attention to um, EDI or DEI right now because, you know, we've got to worry about rising interest rates and inflation and stuff like that. And I think, I think this is very short-sighted. And what we're seeing on the part of uh, what we would call best practices board behavior is a few things that I think are, are very practical and things that uh, will have an impact. And the first, um, the first one is kind of an obvious one, which is, you know, look, look at the board composition yourself, of, your, of, of the board that you sit on. And um, I don't know about you, but many of the boards that I sit on, and one of them is a, is a, a private company the, uh, where I'm on an advisory board, um, and then I've sat on a lot of uh, non-for-profit boards. And it is really important when you're looking, when, when you're actually, look at yourselves, um, do we have not only the right skills around the table, but do we have young people? Um, do we have um, people who represent our customers, our employees? Um, have, we, have we actually taken any steps to try to find and include people who might be somewhat different from us, who would bring, by the way, some point of view, skill, capability that we as an organization need. And I think that needs to be done in a very rigorous way. And I think board chairs and board secretaries have a huge responsibility to, to do something about that. So that's, you know, looking at yourselves. Then I think the next level is looking at the organization. And this is where uh, the, oh, and by the way, on this young thing, I was, I was listening to a, um, a podcast the other day 
in which this uh, individual who sits on the, well, actually was the founder of the um, governance uh, GRI Institute. Um, and he, he was saying that what we really need on boards is to bring in a bunch of young people if we really want to figure out what to do about um, the environment, the social side of things and better governance because they have very, very clear points of view that we, I'm, I'm an older person, Sandra's not nearly as old as I am, but we don't necessarily have the same sense of urgency around these yeah. things. So yeah. um, when yeah, we talk about sure. equity, I've, I'm also talking about younger people. Then you have to have the organizational dimension. And this is where a board really needs to insist that the, that the management team um, do a whole bunch of things that are appropriate, appropriate for the business. The first thing is I would, I would want um, to make sure that the organization is doing a demographic survey. Yeah. And you, you start uh, with it, just trying to understand what the makeup of your organization is. Um, doing demographic surveys is entirely legal. Um, we do a lot of them, set them up for our clients. That you should do them on a regular basis, probably every nine months to every year because things change. And this is where you can start to address this issue that, that Sandra was talking about, which is we hired a whole bunch of people. They're there for the first 18 months and between 18 months and three years, they leave. What the heck is going on? Yeah. And, um, and how is our onboarding process? How is that um, you know, working? Are we doing, are not only are we doing training, but are we doing the kind of training where people are actually able to integrate the training into their work lives? Yeah. Um, and we should be, board should be asking uh, to get the results not only of retention, but also the results of exit surveys. Why are people leaving? And um, you want, want to look at culture surveys and engagement surveys because, and, and really asking some tough questions. And I think the third level would be to think about the outside view. Um, so are we doing enough to engage with communities? Yeah. And Sandra and I worked with an agency recently that um, has plays a very active role in the GTA, and they had not actually begun to engage with yeah. the communities. They, they engage with the businesses mm -hmm. in various parts of the city, but they haven't engaged with the communities. And um, we found a similar situation with another agency that we worked with, a very important uh, agency yeah. in the city of Toronto where they'd made a huge amount of effort to engage with indigenous communities, but proximate to their business were a huge number of people who were from um, Asian descent and uh, black communities and other communities. And they kind of had forgotten those communities. So I think as a board member, I would, I would want to be making sure that, that I was looking at those three dimensions ourselves, yeah. The organization on whose board we serve and how we're doing with respect to communities. And by the way, I mean, th that becomes even more important when you start to think about some of the industries that you may be in, if it's mining, forestry, agriculture, um, manufacturing, any of these organizations um, potentially have to really think about the stakeholders um, who are quite diverse they ought to be dealing with. And then, you know, there's the question about, um, you know, uh, risk. And I think that the, the thing that, that is quite disturbing to me is that people are saying, oh, well, you know, as I said earlier, maybe we don't need to pay as much attention to this because we've got these, all these business issues that we need to, you know, the price of oil and gas and um, interest rates and this, that, the other thing. Um, I think that probably now more than ever, I, I don't think the things that, uh, Sandra talked about initially um, these concerns on the part of younger people who get older, by the way, and have more buying power as they get older. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're not going to go away. We yeah. are getting more diverse. Uh, the customer base of all of the businesses on boards whose boards we might serve um, or organizations, non-for-profit, um, universities, hospital systems, you name it, uh, are more diverse. And we run the risk of, of really losing touch with the communities. I, I'm going to say one last thing that's probably really controversial, which is I think board members need to have courage yeah. to push back. And one of the things that um, 
Sandra and I have written a white paper that we have not yet published for a variety of reasons on what happened to Lisa Laflamme. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a, a board decision um, that may or may not have been the right decision, but I find it very interesting that the three or five, I can't remember, women yeah. who sit on that board did not have anything to say about why they made that decision or whether they thought it was the right decision or the wrong decision. Um, and you know that I think does bring up the point that in this case, there wasn't any scrutiny of it, but I think going forward, there may be more scrutiny of boards yeah. and the decisions they make around these um, these yeah. matters. So Sandra, yeah. any thoughts that you have about yeah. risk? Factors? Well, it's, it's interesting. I really appreciated you kind of focusing on that piece of it because I do think that the risk is huge, the reputational risk, the risk to brand. And again, you know, every generation is different, um, but I definitely find that younger employees today will make a decision to not go into a specific fast food chain based on an incident or, um, or, or frankly, a stance that, 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 that uh, even that fast food franchise has taken. Um, and you've probably heard of some of these brands and they've arrived in Canada and uh, there's young people protesting, I'm not going in there because this is a very anti-LGBTQ plus organization. And you're surprised that they've done the research and they know that, but they are incredibly connected. And I think the thing you said that it's the thing that kind of troubles me mostly now is, you know, we're making some good progress in terms of organizations knowing what they have to do at home, what's their own housework look like. But to Mary's point, this piece of connecting authentically with stakeholders outside of the organization, indigenous communities, let's say in the city of Toronto, that couldn't be more important. And one of the things I think we've all learned, you know, as, as we've learned about, you know, maybe we began our careers fighting, you know, gender inequity and then really just trying to, to work on human equity is the notion of broadly consulting. Um, it's free and it's fun. And if you don't know the answers, you can broadly consult, you can bring community members together and ask them um, to describe their experience of your product, your company, your brand, whatever it is. But I think, Mary, that's a really important point. And I would also say that it didn't even hit me really till probably three years ago when I started making presentations to boards that the powers that directors have, to your point, please be courageous, right? To ask amazingly tough questions. We've seen CEOs literally change their mind on an issue that maybe someone within has been pushing them on the back gently. They walked out of a board meeting and said, this is a must do. We need a strategy. And to Mary's point, demographics, why wouldn't you want to know who works for you? And all kinds of Ontario and Quebec human rights organizations provide free advice on how to run um, uh, an ethical, confidential uh, workforce demographic survey. And you get the snapshot. You don't need to be afraid of the truth. I've had people say, well, if I get the facts, what I'm going to have to do? We've said, we're, we're going to let you off the hook for six months. Just review the data. And if you see gaps, ask yourself, who's not in the conversation? And again, if, if people on boards can keep walking into rooms and saying, who's not here? It's a pretty simple thing to train yourself to do. Who's not here? Well, I don't see any young people. Um, I don't see any members of the black community. I don't think we have anyone here who is indigenous. Um, that's, those are gaps. And what can, you, what can you do to overcome those gaps? So, so two points you made, I think are incredibly important. Know who your workforce is. Um, you know, treat the data as a gift and then to focus on the outside, because I do think that's where I think, Mary, both you and I have been surprised at the number of organizations who've said, oh, wait a minute, one last thing before you leave. We don't have relationships um, with with diverse communities in our own city. And you're like, OK, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Yeah. OK, I think that was kind of all that we wanted to speak about, but we would love if you've got questions um, or thoughts or observations um, to respond or have a further, further dialogue. I think Dora had a question. I do, I do. And as you were talking, I thought of an incident which, um, someone described to me 
Uh, and it goes to surveys and how we do it and what we're trying to get and what we do with that. And so this is about somebody who um, happens to be Brazilian. He's black. He works for a major Canadian um, corporation. And he, uh, when he's asked to fill out the survey and self-identify, he puts in other, um, which really bothers the team because they want to make sure that they are covered like he and, and he's a fairly senior person but his view is that I don't want to be um, you know noted as black and and it goes a bit further because he said my children I have two girls one physically is not black and one is black mm -hmm. you know they look different yep. he says what is the question that's going to come to them so it just, I think, maybe it's a note of caution or how do you deal with this kind of a situation when you want the stats, but how do you use it and what are you getting it for? So I just well, saw that right there. Yeah, it, it's an interesting question. You, you probably have all heard the story of, of Meghan Markle, who was talking about long before she became a member of a royal family or not a member of a royal family, however you want to look at it. Um, but what was interesting about one of the interviews she did a few years ago was she talked about attending school and, and being, here's the form, what's your name, would you know your, your, your phone number, and uh, you male, female, um, black, white. And she came home and said to her mother, well, I'm both. And her mother said, it's time for you to draw the new box. When we run workforce demographic surveys, we urge people to self-identify. It's a powerful thing to do, but but to your point, if there's you know 150 different ethnic groups in a country, could you have 150? No. So we do tend to start with you know the federal government acknowledge you know four labels for equity deserving people. So you know women still underrepresented in many professions and and on boards as you know. Um, indigenous peoples, are you Métis, Inuit, or First Nations? Um, we'll ask people to check, are you visible minority or racialized? Again, federal government uh, language and persons with disabilities. But if you're running a demographic survey and you don't have a way for people to type in how they want to self-identify, then that's a bad survey. The other thing is in the old days, you know, you could only pick one thing and we understand intersectionality now. Um, one of my favorite days is we rolled out a survey and a woman wrote me and said, I heard you're kind of one of the people working on this workforce demographic survey. Uh, for the first time in my life, I checked female, black, gay. And I almost burst out crying because I was able to actually say this is who I am. And just remember, if people can self-identify at work, even on a workforce demographic survey, it's been proven to drive up employee engagement, because here's what people think. Hmm, okay, my organization's collecting this. They must want to know I work here and they must want this information. And they, they believe it or not, assume it's for a good reason. And that, that as actually creates a feeling of more affection or respect for the organization. Because what the organization's saying is you can do this or not, it must be voluntary by law, but if you do it, we want you to feel comfortable telling us who you are, which is the first step towards being authentic at work. So again, we've seen, Mary, I mean, I hate to say this, this sounds so, so, so awful, but I've seen DEI training that's made it worse. I've seen workforce demographic surveys that are a nightmare. You have to make sure you're using the right tool and that the content is, is I would say, appropriate for the organization and and helps people come up with actions you don't just if you mary and i've seen this we talked to clients who said well we took some training i learned about indigenous cultural history and i came back to my desk and i said did anyone else take the course and no one did so that was it yeah it, it becomes very very empty and dora one of the things just occurred to me though about this person who's quite senior mm -hmm. who didn't want to identify as black Maybe, you know, maybe this time around, he doesn't want to, but if in his workplace, um, he starts to see movement of things that, you know, where, um, where appropriate actions are being taken to welcome people who are Black, who are identifying as Black, 
um, it might encourage him because it, it's private. I mean, he doesn't yeah. have to, he's not telling anybody. He, he doesn't have to make a big deal about it at work, but he might find it easier and maybe even more attractive to yeah. in answering a future survey to say, yeah, I'm part of that black community. I'm part of other communities too, but um, I can, I can, you know, feel comfortable self-identifying as part of that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and to Mary's point, there's really cool things that happen when you know you're not the only. Um, yeah. I was working with an organization and um, people, people actually said to me, I don't think anyone here is Indigenous. And I said, well, first of all, don't walk around and try and guess because you have no idea. Um, you know, the, the, like, it, like in most things, the broad uh, kinds of diversity within the Indigenous community. But the, the demographic survey showed there were 40 people within the organization who self-identified as Indigenous. And someone said, I'm going to send out a note as an Indigenous employee and ask if anybody wants to be in some kind of like maybe an affinity group or an employee resource group. And they sent it company-wide and said, if you check that box, um, and you would like to be part of this group, we're, we're just going to meet in the lunchroom in this private area. Um, and, and half the people who self-identified showed up for the first meeting and said, I thought I was the only person who was, and then they found out common uh, ancestries and all kinds of really cool things. So, so the thing is, you know, I, I definitely understand why people sometimes don't trust a survey or don't want to self-identify. But to Mary's point, if you release the results and you said to the employees, you know, let's say we have 10,000 people working here and 26% of our employees identify as black. I think people say, you know, gee, is that good? Let's take a look at it. But at least it's an acknowledgement of who's working where you're working. And if you didn't do the survey in year one, the stats show that you'll probably do it in year two if the company shows the results, publishes them. Yeah. Then you'll, yeah. So I love I love the demographics and I, I get excited every time someone tells me that they felt that it was the first time in their life they've been able to confidently self-identify. Um, and again, you know, no, if, if it's the right survey, of course, there's no way to attach personal information um, with with the responses you provided on the survey. They're not connected. Great. Doesn't look like there are any more questions. Well, I, I'll hop in again because I do okay, have another fine. one. <laughs> okay. Um, and this is more on the governance side because most boards, they've got to measure, right? You, you know, you can measure diversity by whatever metrics you put in, you measure equity. So, based on your discussion, um, how would you measure inclusion? And is this because people stay like have you come up with a measurement that boards would do to say yes we're fulfilling that end of it or can you measure it well i think one of the ways you can um is through culture surveys mm -hmm. um because if you get um if you get people answering because culture by the way is different from engagement culture is is how work gets done engagement is how you feel about your own job um, and um, what we often see, and, and organizations probably ought to be doing culture surveys once every other year or so anyway, um, if, you, if you start to get, if you get, have data at the, at the sort of outset that says that, um, you know, the organization is hierarchical, decisions are top down, um, people are kind of disconnected with with the organization and you start to see improvement in some of the culture limiting scores I, I think that is one way of doing it um, engagement surveys are not very good uh, at getting to the bottom of these things because most yeah. engagement surveys are completely rigid you can't really add a lot of questions and oh by the way in culture surveys the ones that we think are really powerful, you can ask specific questions around inclusion and, um, and get, you know, get not only quantitative data, but qualitative data. Um, so engagement surveys are a bit tough. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, they're, they're, uh, the other way is to look at retention, um, quite frankly. Uh, if you start to see retention going up among uh, equity deserving groups, clearly you're doing something right. Uh, if you start to see more people coming in, um, 
and, or, and being promoted and that sort of thing, you can measure whether what you're doing is, is paying off. Yeah, I, I, Mary's absolutely right. I mean, promotion rates, I think, are really important. Um, one of the things we try to do is if, if organizations don't want to run an EDI survey or DEI survey, we, we often will suggest that they put some of those questions on their upcoming um, engagement survey. Um, but yeah, to Mary's point, the, the last metric I'll throw out for you, because I was shocked when I learned this and it's not changed, is when employees consider where they want to come and work or if they're going to stay, there's one thing at the top of the list. Do I believe I will be promoted within this organization? And if the answer is no, you can forget it because they will leave. I mean, we've all seen employees who we think, oh, we're really mentoring you and doing a great job with you. And they go a little bit too long where they feel like they've been promoting. You turn around and they're gone because they've left to get the promotion. So I think it's really important to understand, you know, especially, you know, culturally different organizations have done this, I think, really effectively. You know, can you develop an internal leadership program to help fast track? Um, some employees, and I know we did it at CBC. It was, uh, it was unbelievably successful because these were people who kept losing jobs out to external candidates. And so we developed an internal program and fast tracked them to take on leadership. Okay, I'm going to stop because I think Logan has a question. Hello, Logan. Oh, hi. So thanks. Uh, an important conversation uh, today. So thanks very much for that. Um, I wonder what you think about uh, the idea of actually requiring uh, diversity at the board level. So, you know, baking it into the bylaws that, it, you know, there'll be some kind of gender balance representation from visible minorities or something. So do you think that that's a good idea or should we just sort of be patient and let that evolve organically? And I say that because, I mean, we've been talking about gender balance on boards mm -hmm. for gosh, how long, eh? 20 yep. years, certainly. And it doesn't seem to be making a lot of progress, some. So let's, should we force it or what? I, yeah, th this is a topic that, that, um, that I've been involved in with respect, you know, conversations about this for a very long time. And I think I started out by saying um, that this should be voluntary and but we're not making any progress with women at all and um well some but not much and you know what you, what you have seen is countries where where it was mandated uh, things changed very quickly and i think no one would say that governance in countries like um norway is bad um it's pretty good and um, so I'm, I'm at the point of saying that um, there ought to be some hard targets, um, you know, they're the 30% club and things like that. Um, one of the things that I think we could think about being mandatory is that um, it be that interviews of prospective board members could somehow be blind. I, I, don't, I don't quite know what the answer is, but I think we're gonna to have to start thinking about some harder answers. Um, and there, there is a, a real danger of um, one of the, th the uh, Sanders referred to this a couple of times, the only one syndrome is as bad as having none. Yeah. If, there, if you are the only black, if you are the only indigenous, if you are the only woman on a board or in a senior management team, you might as well, you almost might as well not be there because it is very hard to, for that one person to have an impact on the conversation and the dialogue. Uh, so I, I can't say I've had, um, I, I'm answering your question with a yes or no or whatever, but I think we have to rethink um, this a little bit further and, and reopen the conversation because we are not doing as good a job as we should. And by the way, I, you know, I think very few countries have have really solved this, but it yeah. does need to be addressed. I, I, Mary and I always have such interesting conversations around this topic because I think one of the things is, you know, I always beg people to 
not to use a word like quota or target because what the damage it does is this if i say well we're going to set up this uh, we're going to set up a quota we're going to have two black vps in our organization and then two black, black vps are hired you would not believe how many canadians in 2020 almost 23 say oh so you're the black vp they had to hire because the person we needed a black vp so forget that the person has four qualifications or a PhD. Um, so what the way we have to shift our thinking is really around this. And I love that Joe Biden does it uh, or did it. Joe Biden has an opening in the Supreme Court. Joe Biden stands up and says the vacancy will be filled by a black woman. And people say, well, shouldn't you consider everyone first? And he says, well, I'm going to consider um, the profile of someone who's never before sat on the Supreme Court ever. And then people said, well, you know, and I've heard this many times, well, you know, we can hire diverse people, but they better be qualified, which is just so insulting as if they wouldn't be, right? Yeah. And then with the Supreme Court, Joe Biden was sent the names of not a thousand, over 2,500 resumes came their way of brilliant women, jurists, multiple degrees. And by the way, the, the final candidate more qualified than anyone else sitting on that current Supreme Court. So it's not as if brilliant people aren't out there and they look very differently and they come from different backgrounds. And you know, maybe their parents moved here when they were two from India. But the reality is that what we have to ask ourselves, especially at boards is who's not here? Whose voice haven't I heard? And you do it for every group if you can, and then you try to set goals. And you say, wouldn't it be great if we could find somebody who understands anti-Black racism um, in downtown Toronto better than I do? Because we don't, we can't know the experience of another. I, I had a board member say to me once, well, I'm on a board and I, you know, I believe in diversity of thought. Oh, that's fantastic. If you claim to be able to think the same as a black woman your age, uh, you know, really, we should do a documentary on you. It's not even realistic. We need people to come into rooms and bring with them their lived experience and not to teach us as unpaid you know, trainers, but so that they can say, well, actually, that's not how it works in my community. My community doesn't think that way. And you can, again, speak for every community. And by the way, Just, I think it's easier to change. Oh, sorry. Yes, Logan. Well, I was going to say there's a couple of questions there in the chat, so I won't hold you up. But I just say that, you know, it just seems to me that there's a, a challenge baked right into the thesis that you're offering. If a board that is, you know, that looks like me is trying to promote diversity in an organization, you know, in, among the, the junior ranks in the organization, it just, it just seems that if we want the board to succeed in promoting that diversity, oh, yeah. then we have to you know, start at the top, it would seem yeah. to me. But, well, but it's, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's easier, by the way, for boards to change their composition quickly yep. than for senior management teams. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we've seen that a lot lately where um, we're doing EDI strategies, boards and, you know, the executive team have asked for this. And the board basically is quite diverse. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and because you've got terms, you've got term limits. Yeah. And board chairs and, you know, pressure from proxy uh, organizations and investors, um, you can, you know, the, the board chair can force this pretty yeah. darn fast. Yeah. The problem, and, and you're absolutely right, Logan, if you, if you yeah. haven't done your homework on yourself, it is really yeah. hard for you to demand action yeah. on the part of the, the senior yeah. management team. All right, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, good, good question. One of the questions, Mary, which we talked about today, is given that there are legal challenges to the affirmative action in the U.S., do you see any legal challenges to similar actions in Canada? Um, I, I will say this, that um, I like to use Roe versus Wade as an example because I know Canadians are very much influenced and concerned um, for good reason about what happens on the other side of the border. Um, but, but right now we do have government officials who have stood up after Roe versus Wade in Canada and Justin Trudeau, you know, tweeted, texted, you know, did it all to basically say this is not the law in this country. Um, so I think there's, um, it's frightening when you see things happening, um, you know, in the country next to you um, that, that seem to be moving towards uh, restricting rights um, as opposed to granting them, which is really, again, very interesting historically. Um, but I do think it's troubling. 
um, that that some of these conversations are being held. Uh, because again, you know, affirmative action, um, you know, those initiatives really um, came about as a solution to um, a truth, which is that um, there were no black vice presidents or there were no women on boards. Um, and by the way, just a, a quick word, people always say to me, is EDI and DEI politically correct? And I always say to people, let's talk about why you think this is political. I mean, maybe it's moral. Um, may, maybe it's um, financial. There's all kinds of different reasons people want to talk about EDI. But but I would say that never having been a politician, nor would I want to be, um, there's no part of this that's political. You either believe in human equity and fairness or you don't. Um, if you don't believe in human equity and fairness, um, you know, that situation may change in your own lifetime um, because, you know, you may find the composition of your own family changing in a country that's more and more diverse. Um, I always joke about indigo. Um, when my first grandson was born, I couldn't find a book that didn't show blonde, blue-eyed children when I went to indigo. And over a course of 11 years, that has changed so dramatically that I can find books now in indigo, a whole wall of books uh, for Black History Month that are amazing books by Canadian authors celebrating diversity in Canada. And Indigo has quickly realized that their customer base doesn't just want to, not the grandmas and the grandpas and not the moms and dads. They want representation matters and they want to see themselves in books and stories. So people are figuring it out and that's the good news. But just a reminder, there's nothing about this that's affiliated with the political party. Equity, fairness and justice belong to us all. That's my anti, it's not politics rant. That's right. <laughs> I think we're getting up to time. I, they, we I are. <laughs> you have quite, there was a, a point from Lisa that any law requiring EDI in the board will be challenged oh, yeah. eventually. I, you know, I, those laws that have taken place in Europe haven't been challenged so far. So yeah. they're entrenched. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we can, can avoid legal challenges. I, I, I hope we can avoid having a law in the first place, but um, we shall see. So um, I'm going to, close there and let Dora or or Clara or Mike take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra and Mary, for your presentation regarding ADI. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to also thank the Quebec branch for um, presenting this today. And to everyone who has attended, thank you as well. And I look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar.